Welcome to Live Life Creative. Hi, I'm Dylan. Thanks for spending some time with me today. If you've listened to the previous episode, the one where I was on the road, you know this podcast is starting to take a different turn. Um, it's starting to veer more towards photography because uh, that's mainly what I'm into. So I hope that you're interested in that. And if you're not, I'm cool with that. I don't want to take up your time if it's if I'm wasting your time. Uh, but if you have somebody in your friend group or family that that is interested in photography, maybe this podcast is from th- for them instead. Uh, So to kind of make that change, I wanted to lay out my basic kit, uh, what I use to photograph with. So just going to lay a little bit of background, a little bit of groundwork for uh, episodes that are coming up in the future, Uh, just to understand uh, some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about when I talk about, oh, I photographed this event or uh, did this uh, photo shoot or something like that. Uh, It gives an idea of the tools I'm working with. So you can have kind of have a baseline uh, maybe to see where your own experience, uh, your own kit will compare. So to start off with is just the Nikon D7000. So there's two ways to look at how I got this camera. Either I got this camera for free or I enslaved myself for the rest of my life to get this camera. So what happened is I got married, which is awesome. I love my wife and the enslaved part, that's an over-exaggeration for sure. So she already had this camera when we got married. It was a gift from her parents uh, for graduation. So when we got married, I just took it out one day, of eh, maybe six months or so after we got married, and just started messing around with it. Like for sure, I'm the kind of guy. I'm kind of cheap, really. I would never just like buy an expensive camera just right off the bat. And to me, this was an expensive camera. I would never just buy this for myself just to kind of get into it. Like this, I don't know how I'd ever get into photography if I didn't get married and she already had this camera. Uh, This is an older camera. It came out in 2012, 2013. Uh, So it's getting pretty old. So I'm I, I like it pretty well. When it first came out, this was, I think, a new line of prosumer cameras for Nikon. Uh, so this was uh, kind of in between the D700, which is still semi-pro, uh, but better than the D5000, 5100, whatever is out at the time, uh, which was pretty uh, strictly consumer DSLR. So it is nicer. It has some features, uh, better controls, more con- physical controls on the cam- camera body than like the D5000 series. Um, I really appreciate that because I pick up like a D5, like D5500, I think is what current is current at this time of recording. And there's just like, it's tough to just change like ISO. Like you have to go through the menu to change ISO. Whereas on the D7000 and the series uh, D7000s, uh, <clears throat> there's just a button, you know, hold the button, the ISO button, flip the dial to whatever ISO, super easy, super quick. So it's a little bit more, um, I think it's called the flagship control layout or just a little bit more pro a layout so you have more of your controls right there in front of you. And overall, it's a decent camera. It's a good camera. It takes good quality pictures, uh, 16 megapixels, I think. So I think 24 or so is pretty standard nowadays, so a little bit lower. But I mean, I have plenty of pixels that I need. Uh, I can't crop in a whole ton. If I need a crop, I can't do it a lot of it. So I try mostly not to. It helps me. If I get the composition right in camera, that's always better anyway. Um, My biggest issue with it is definitely the ISO performance. The noise performance is not great. Like if you have decent lighting, you know, uh, if you're outdoors, there's usually plenty of lighting outdoors, at least during the day. Uh, Whether or not it's good lighting, there's usually plenty of it. Um, Or if you're indoors near like a big bank of windows or like good or at least strong lights, then it does fine. You know, it does okay. Uh, but once it, the light starts getting kind of crappy or if it just kind of gets like more dim and you have to start cranking the ISO, it doesn't look good. In my personal opinion, 1600 is about as far as I like to go. I can still work with things pretty well at ISO 1600 if the exposure is pretty good in camera. Uh, 2000, if I really, really need to push it, I'll go to 2000. Uh, but higher than that, I don't like to go to 2,500 really. I almost never go to 3,200. It'd have to be pretty extreme for me to have to do that. So 1,600 is about the max I like to go at that. And it's fine. It's not great. If you're just viewing the image on your phone, like it'll look okay. Um, but to really have that crisp, clean, a good looking image, 
uh, you'd have to stay at, at least from, in my opinion, uh, 800, 400, something like that. Uh, otherwise, uh, frames per second, I think is about five and a half. I don't do any sports or anything like that. So that's fine by me. Uh, I'm trying to think about any other big issues or anything with it, but you know, over, overall it's a solid camera. I'm pretty sure it's weather sealed. So that's pretty good for, you know, being a kind of prosumer camera. So that's something I really appreciate. Um, so my best lens, my one big investment in my lens moving on here a bit is the Tamron 24 to 70 F 2.8. Uh, this is the G2 USD. So it's a little bit of a newer lens. It is great. I like it a lot. I mean, my point of comparison are kit lenses that came with the D 7,000. So anything that's even approaching a pro lens is like a huge step up for me from that point. And when I first got this lens, I was like blown away. I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing is so sharp. It is amazing. I love this thing. And that's how I feel even now. I mean, as long as, you know, the autofocus in the camera works properly, which is sometimes a little sketchy. Um, I mean, once it's in focus, like it's in a great sharp image. I like it a lot. I know Tamron used to have a bad rap. Sigma 2 used to have a bad rap for having kind of lower quality lenses. But I don't get that with this at all, um, at least in my kind of more limited experience. I, I think this is a great lens. I use it a lot. I really appreciate that it has uh, vibration compensation. That's Tamron's name for it, you know, uh, vibration reduction, uh, optical stabilization, image stabilization. They're all kind of the same concept. So I really appreciate that. Uh, that helps a lot because sometimes... I do a lot of events is what I'm focusing on is finding uh, client jobs to shoot events for them. And the lighting in those in events is generally terrible. So if I'm shooting down at one fiftieth of a second, one sixtieth, something like that, the vibration compensation comes in real handy. Um, I don't like shooting at that low shutter speed because life happens too fast for that shutter speed. You know, people are moving. So really if I, could I'd like to shoot at 200, 200, um, one over 200, one over 250. Uh, if I could, that's just not always possible, uh, with lighting conditions. Um, the lowest I try to go to is about one over one over 100. Uh, and that seems to work pretty all right for most things. Um, otherwise 24 to 70, pretty standard zoom range. Uh, it's, it's a little big. I mean, it's bigger than a kit lens for sure. Uh, but I find it pretty easy to handle overall. Uh, balance is pretty all right with the D7000. It's n The D7000 is not a huge body. It's definitely not like a D5 or a Canon uh, 1DX Mark II or something like that. It's not huge or even like a Nikon D850, but it's a good size. You know, you can really get a good grip on it and balance with the 24 to 70. It's pretty good. Uh, next up is <laughs> this next lens. It's cool. I like it. It's quirky. Um, I picked it up for $170. This is a Nikon 70 to 210 millimeter F4 lens. So this is, <laughs> I was doing a little bit of reading up on it and I'm not sure if I'm remembering this correctly, but this might've been the first autofocus 70 to 200 ish lens that Nikon ever made, or it's definitely one of the first. It's probably older than I am. I'm pretty sure. Um, I bought it from a wedding photographer. She was selling off some of her old kit and this was like her second photographer's package, like her backup package uh, of kit stuff that she was using. So she was uh, kind of slimming down her, uh, her gear. Um, so she was selling this and you know, it's an older lens. It's sound when the autofocus motor is loud. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, so I try not to use it during like a quiet moment or anything like that. If I have to, if I know something's coming up, I might pre-focus. Uh, if I know something's going to happen during a quiet moment, um, manual focus, not happening. I mean, there is technically, you can grab the very end of the lens and that is like the focus ring and you can crank it really hard and you're actually cranking the actual <laughs> autofocus motor of this thing. And it's nuts because just when you're cranking it by hand, it's like, Grr! you can hear the gears grinding on it. It is, <laughs> it is what it is. It was $170 and I think I got a fair deal. Um, F4 is not a great aperture, minimum aperture, um, but it's definitely better than the F5.6 I was using on the long end on my kit lens. So 
And now with the 24 to 70, the 70 to 210, which is also a strange range, I've got kind of the standard ranges covered and that's working out all right for me so far. Again, with the F4, the smaller aperture, not as much light coming in combined with the noise performance on the D7000 not being all that great. It can be tough sometimes. It can definitely be tough. have to work around it. Um, the best I can do is like create the best image possible within the camera. So then if noise comes up in the image later when I'm processing the images, at least it's a strong image, you know, and hopefully that'll forgive some of the, some of the noise. Um, so that's my main kit. That's what I use for most everything uh, with the D7000. Right now I'm saving up money, you know, building up my business, trying to get clients, uh, my event photography business, so I can, you know, invest in better kit, starting with a new camera body. And you know how there's a thing people say online, oh, your your camera doesn't matter, your gear doesn't matter, it's just your phot photographer's eye, and that's definitely true to an extent. But no matter how good my photographer's eye or my aesthetic ability is, that's not going to change the noise performance of my camera body. If I have to go to 32, 6400 to try to get a shot, it's still going to look terrible no matter how good my artistic sense is, right? So this is, a, this is one of the situations where gear matters. So I'm saving up for a D750, still not a new uh, camera model I know by from what I've read about it, from what I've been able to get my hands on it and use it a little bit, uh, I think it's going to be a solid choice. Uh, I know a few other photographers that use the D750 and they like it a lot. Uh, so that's my plan for the future anyway. Uh, flash unit, definitely necessary, for sure necessary, uh, especially for this one event I did uh, in a future episode that I'm probably going to record today but release later is at this restaurant called The Green Well here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. By the way, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, great restaurant. I love it. Uh, after this event, I actually went there for my birthday a little bit later in the week because I liked it so much. Uh, but that place was dark. This event was at night. You know, it started like six or so, 630 maybe. So, you know, flash saved my butt. Like absolutely could not have done it without flash at all. Even with the flash unit, I was at ISO 3200 and that was still a little too much. I'll get more into like how that all worked out for me uh, in that episode. But suffice to say, I use a on-camera flash, called, well, not the pop-up flash, but a flash unit, a speed light uh, from a brand called Alturo. Don't know much about the company. Um, it's a very, very, very budget speed light. I think it's like 60 bucks on Amazon or B&H or something like that. I just asked for it for Christmas. Um, and it's actually my father-in-law who ended up giving it to me. So thanks, father-in-law. Uh, and he also got the wireless flash uh, trigger set with it, which is really nice. Not the most reliable trigger set. Also from Alturo, 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 whatever the pronunciation is. Uh, also, uh, not super reliable. Uh, so I kind of have to work with it and fiddle with it to get it to work correctly. Trying out a few different channels and stuff. But uh, when I use the speed light itself, like mounted to my camera, it works fine. It works reliably. Um, uses four double A's, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, cause if I go for one time use batteries, that's super wasteful or I go and get rechargeable batteries, then I'm charging batteries all the time. So I'd like to get one of the new speed lights that comes with its own like lithium ion batteries. I think that's a better solution, but overall it's fine. It's a good flash, um, to start with at least. I don't think I'm going to stick with Alturo as a company. Um, I like Godox, 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 I think is the pronunciation of that one. Uh, I think I'll go with that company in the future because it's been recommended to me by some other podcasters, uh, specific, specifically uh, Gina Militia. She hosts the So You Want to Be a Photographer podcast, Biv Mouthful. Uh, really enjoy that podcast. Uh, heard good things about Godox from her. Uh, she's been a photographer, commercial all kinds of stuff for like 25 years. So I think she's probably got an idea of what she's talking about. Um, so when I move to the next flash, I think it's going to be from them. Uh, SD cards, SanDisk Extreme Pro, uh, 80 megabits per second, read write speed or read speed or something, but write speed somewhere around there too. 
uh, they're good. You know, I, one of my friends, photographer friends, uh, alerted me to this sale on Amazon and normally they were like 40 bucks a piece or something, but I got each of these for 13. I think I either paid $27 each for them or paid $27 total for them, something like that. So I got a really good deal on them and they're good. You know, they're kind of fast ish. Um, I don't know if I got faster uh, SD cards that it would help me or not, because I'm not sure how fast the D7000 camera body itself is capable of writing and reading. I'm not sure what the cap on is on that. So I don't know if I got like a super fast, like 300 megabits per sec- megabytes per second SD card, if that would actually help me or not. So I don't know. But these two cards, uh, 64 gigs a piece. Uh, good cards. Uh, the D7000 has two card slots, so I use them both uh, and shoot back up raw. Um, camera strap. I like it a lot. Peak design slide strap. Uh, when I was looking at this, I didn't realize that the slide was like for smaller camera bodies, I don't think. Uh, like mirrorless, like the Sony A6000 type smaller cameras. And there's actually a bigger uh, camera strap that Peak Design makes for like you know, DSLR sized bodies, but the slide works fine for me. Um, like it doesn't hurt my shoulder. It's about a half inch across or something like that, but I like, it's perfectly fine. And I really love uh, peak designs, uh, camera strap system. If you're not familiar with it, what you do is you put these sort of little plastic circle things on your camera and they attach to the camera. eye things on the camera body, Uh, by you kind of loop it through the string that's on it and those little circle plastic things they actually hook into the into a receiver on the camera strap so you can pop your strap on and off really quick which is really great you know if you don't want to have your strap on all the time and you don't have to take 20 minutes to take your camera strap off which is a huge pain in the neck so peak design really like them um i'm gonna buy a camera backpack from them someday And speaking of camera backpacks, what I'm using for a camera bag is my college backpack. So when I uh, started college, my freshman year, you have all the orientation stuff. Um, Each student got a Cornerstone University backpack, and that's where I went to uh, college at. And it's a nice bag. Uh, OGO, I think I looked it up one time. It's like an urban something is the model, something with urban in it. And for college, it worked great. For being a camera backpack, it works fine. Like, it works pretty good. Um, If I had an actual camera backpack, I'm sure I'd be able to fit more gear into it. Because what I did is to turn this into a camera bag is obviously a normal backpack doesn't have really any padding in it, right? Uh, So, you know those little, like, shoulder bags? Like, you get these for free sometimes when you buy a new camera, Um, and it's just got like a shoulder strap and it's got like three compartments on the inside and some various pockets around the outside. So what I did is I took one of those bags that I had from a different camera purchase and I cut the top, the lid off the shoulder bag. And then it was still too long to fit inside the bag. So I actually cut, um, one end off the camera bag as well to make it fit inside the backpack. Um, And actually, when I was cutting up the shoulder bag, I was using it with a different to put it inside of a different bag and it wasn't fitting properly in there. So that's why I cut off the end. It's probably still be too long. If I was doing it with this backpack at the beginning, I'd still have to cut off that end. Um, So then I just put this, this mangled camera shoulder bag into the backpack in the bottom. And that provides all the protection and padding for the lenses and flash and camera body and stuff. And it works fine. Um, The main compartment of the backpack opens up pretty wide. I'm looking at it right now, sitting behind me here in the studio. And um, like, it works pretty good. It works fine. Um, One thing about it that I like a lot is that it has a water bottle pocket on the side of it. And that is almost a requirement for me for any backpack uh, is to have a water, some way to have a water bottle on it because I drink water all the time. And I'm constantly <laughs> just drinking water. So I need a place to put my water bottle, right? Um, and if you have a travel travel tripod, like that would be a good pocket to put that into if you wanted. And I've got like a hook on my water bottle so I could put it on like the backpack strap 
if I had to, I guess I'm not a huge fan of that, but I could do that. Um, and that's actually what disappoints me most about the peak design backpack that I want to get is that it, I don't think it has a dedicated, uh, like water bottle pocket for it, which is just me, I guess. Um, but otherwise a great bag from peak design, uh, the, this hack together DIY backpack though, uh, it's pretty good, uh, pretty good amount of pockets on it. Uh, yeah, pretty much all I want to say about it. It's got a laptop sleeve. I don't usually carry a laptop in it. Um, I've got a notebook in there, so that's cool, I guess. <laughs> um, and then, you know, just kind of extra batteries and stuff, extra batteries for the flash for the, I bought another battery for the camera. I've got a few extra cards. Always good to have extras. Uh, one thing that makes me nervous is that I don't have an extra camera body. I mean, I know I could pick up like a cheap, like D, a Nikon D5300 or something like that, like a little bit older, lower quality model, but I just don't want to spend my money buying a crappy camera body when I'm trying to save money to buy a better camera body. And plus there's other things that I want to buy. Like there's costs associated with starting a business. Um, like for instance, I just joined a business group and there's a membership cost involved with that. And there's going to be costs involved with incorporating as an LLC. You know, there's better places to put my money, I think, than to buy a crappy extra camera body right now. And that pretty much wraps up my gear. Um, I know this is not the most exciting episode, but I hope it lays the groundwork for future episodes that I'm going to be recording today. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to listen to sometime in the future if I don't just completely drop off the map. As for the future of this podcast, I don't know where it's going to go. I feel like I either need to rename the podcast away from Live Life Creative or just start a new podcast feed based around a photography, you know, like DK Photo Show or something like that. I've been kind of throwing around a few names in my head. Like, So there's probably going to be some rebranding going on, going on in the future. It's just what sucks about it is that I'm, I'm a fan of the name live life creative. Like that is a call to action. You know, like you want, like who doesn't want to live life more creatively? Like it's a great name for a brand to be inspired by, to, you know, rally behind. So I like the name. I really feel like I'm going to have to give it up. I just wish I had made a t-shirt or something or like a hat with live life creative on it. That would have been pretty fun, but yeah, you know, that's just life, I guess. You gotta you gotta roll with the punches, you gotta evolve with the times or with your interests, I guess. So hope you enjoyed this episode. It's gonna set us up for the future. Uh coming up, I'm gonna be doing a series of episodes. Uh what I learned by photographing, for photographing, dot dot dot. And it's gonna be talking about uh different events that I've shot, uh issues that I've run into that by talking about them to you like oh yeah uh, yeah i heard about this and so the next time you're doing like foot photographing photographing <laughs> an event um you can remember these episodes oh yeah i need to watch out for this this and this and i need to be aware of this and stuff like that it's kind of like uh maybe a bit more shop talk as far as as far as photography goes so hopefully you'll stick around if you're interested in that kind of thing if you're not i totally understand i started this podcast on a different premise than where i'm going to now so um i ask if there is somebody in your life that likes taking pictures you know maybe they want to get better this could be a podcast to help them so just keep that in mind you can follow or your friend can follow live life creative on instagram at live life creative podcast you can also find our website. Well, my website. I'm doing this alone, actually. It's livelifecreativepodcast.xyz. I'll be putting up a brief set of show notes for this episode, just kind of detailing the gear that I use, maybe some links to see where you can find out more information about it. Uh, that's going to be at livelifecreativepodcast.xyz. And if there's any questions that you have, or if you have any feedback on where you want the show to go, then send me a DM or send me a, or tag me in a poster or whatever you want to do on Instagram. I'd love to hear from you. For now, this is Live Life Creative. I'm Dylan, and thank you for spending about 20 minutes with me. Yeah.